Ladies and gentlemen of the Vortex Nation, welcome back to another Vortex Live event. You're on Facebook. I am Ryan Muckiner and your host today. I am so honored to be, uh, to be sitting here next to Steve Rinella, the meat eater. Uh, if you've seen his show, if you've read his books, uh, a man that needs very little to no introduction, but nonetheless, here we are. A um, little bit about Steve here. Uh, meat eater, six seasons strong now. Yeah. Author of multiple books, five, I believe. That's right. One, uh, specifically, The Complete Guide to Hunting, Cooking, and Butchering Wild Game. Almost. The hu Hunting, Butchering, and Cooking Wild Game. Oh, holy smokes, that's a mouthful. And that's uh, two, two volumes. Very good. Two Volume volumes. Volume one and two. Um, this is a really big deal. Uh, Steve, we are a huge fan of you here at Vortex. We, we run the shows in the showroom um, you know, to watch while, while we're here and to have customers watch. And, and your entire um, uh, mantra, ethos, mindset, uh, you are a practitioner of the arts, to say the least. Um, this is a great deal. I, I want to throw a couple of questions at you today and, and let our viewers um, you know, open up and, and uh, hopefully get to know you a little bit better as I am and, and uh, come up with a, a picture of who Steve Rinella is, who the meat eater is, what it is you're doing, and uh, how you're looking to change, I guess, uh, society's perception of, of hunting and fishing and, and, and outdoor activity and, of course, consumption of, of game, which is a big thing. Um, it's, a very, it's a very spiritual thing for myself uh, as well as a sustainable thing. I, I do eat a lot of wild game, obviously. Um, let's get right to it. Uh, tell us about yourself, my friend. How did this all begin, um, you know, from, from infancy to where we are today? Yeah, I got into, well, I get, man, it's, it's had so many different versions over the years, but I, like I def, I approached the, sort of the outdoor space through the lens of hunting where I came out and started doing a lot of magazine work out of school. Yeah. So I was writing magazine pieces about hunting and fishing in the outdoors. And then that kind of went into books. I published my first book in 2004, 2005, and that was called The Scavenger's Guide to Oat Cuisine. And that book was just the story of trying to find all the ingredients from a cookbook that was by, published by a guy named Auguste Escoffier in 1903, back when they ate stuff that people just don't eat now. Sure. Right? So I tried to track down all these ingredients. And looking through the book, which is now considered sort of like the classic French cookbook, I realized that he was cooking things that you can't, that you're just not going to buy in a store nowadays, you know? The only way to get them, really, was, was to hunt and fish for Sure, them. sure. So I, I did a book about that, and that got me, like, working on that really got me thinking a lot about, the, like, sort of the space of wild game, the way people perceive wild game, the relationship that, that people who like to hunt and fish have with wild game. Yeah. Kind of like how, um, how wild game consumption and how the practices of hunting and fishing are viewed through the outside world. And once I started like really thinking about that, I was just off and running, man. Then I right. wrote some more books. And I started doing TV, um, man, 2000, I guess 2010, started doing television. And all I wanted to do in TV was, I, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't like reacting to what I saw out there. It wasn't a comment on what hunting and fishing television looks like. It had nothing to do with that. I wanted to like, to do a show that captured my understanding of hunting, like the capture sure. of hunting the way I think about it, and to tell the like narrative of a hunt, sure. the A to Z of hunting, sure. right? Sure. And that's that's really all I wanted to do, man. And I've been right. very fortunate to to keep doing it. And, and to touch on this, folks, for everybody tuning in again, if you're just tuning in, we have Steve Rinella, the meat eater here in house at Vortex Optics. Um, if you have questions about any aspect of, of hunting, uh, for Steve or, or myself, um, gear. Uh, any, any kind of practice or, or technique that Steve might employ while he's in the field, please shout it out to us. You know, send us a message on, on Facebook or Twitter. Um, you know, please do, don't hesitate to. So uh, we're open for him here today at Vortex uh, on this live event. Um, I'm going to ask Steve a couple of questions, though, and, and if it's something you want us to expand on, uh, feel free to chime in. Uh, one of the biggest things uh, that you're a proponent, proponent of is, is um, one advocation of conservation of public lands um, yeah it's a huge thing obviously as a hunter um, myself I, I do a lot of public land hunting because I just can't afford the private land hunting and it's there it's it's something that that we need to uh, to really be uh, cognitive of and, and conscious of is, is these public lands and their management um, you were just in DC uh, I hope you touch on on that a little bit so so if you would you know why is this so important to you? What is it that, that is your driving force behind this, uh, this public lands movement? My connection to public lands is that, I mean, the, the majority of the hunting I do, not all of it, but the majority of the hunting I do is on public land. And a lot of the people I hang out with are, are public land hunters. Sure. 
And I know that, 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 that when, you, when you look at sort of how wildlife is managed in the United States, how land is managed in the United States, much of most of the dollars that go toward wildlife management that fund our state fish and game agencies are coming from hunters. Hunters are the driving force of wildlife conservation and habitat restoration and yep. oftentimes habitat acquisition yep. that's happening in the U.S. Hunters need access to land and maintaining public lands is a way to maintain the hunting tradition. Maintaining the hunting tradition is a way of maintaining our wildlife heritage. Yes, absolutely. It, it's just, it, it's all very connected and very simple. And I think now and then we've sort of faced political and social movements that have tried to steer us away toward public lands management. Mm -hmm. But I'm a firm believer, I mean, it, it's just a fact. You know, public land, you, you, some people call it like federally owned. It's not federally owned. It's owned by us, yeah. Americans. We have a, someone that administers the land. That's the federal government. And, I, and I'll lend support to that system as long as I'm alive. Absolutely. Absolutely. I am, um, you know, thinking about, you said something, public land hunters, I, I guess, regular Joes, if you will, as I'll call them. Um, have you ever noticed, and, and this is just kind of my own little personal bit, that a lot of people maybe are turned off on the idea of, say, a western hunt, specifically when we start talking about large tracts of land, um, thinking that public land is somehow lesser quality or thinking that public land is somehow um, you know, not as fruitful uh, or is going to be too difficult to access. Do you find that true? As somebody who is truly a, a nationwide hunter, um, do you find public land to be necessarily less fertile, or is it something where you just got to do maybe a little extra homework and, and a little extra legwork. And get yeah, it. it's, that's a great question, man, because, I mean, there's no denying that, that from an entry-level perspective, there's a lot of advantages to private land, especially private land where you have, you know, very limited access of competition, okay? Yeah. That's undeniable. On public land, the learning curve is, is steeper, right? You got you to gotta put in your time, do your research, oftentimes walk more, you got to think more. But I think that, that the reward of it, that you can find hunting, and not just hunting, hunting, wildlife viewing, wilderness experiences, the whole package of camping, being out on the land, being immersed in what you're doing, like the potential is far greater on public land to have like truly memorable hunts. Yeah. And oftentimes, and, and just, just in nuts and bolts hunting, some of the best hunts I've had, right, as far as where you feel like you're, stu you're like walked back in time 200 years and you're living the good old days, which I would argue we are kind of living in the good old days right now. Yeah. But, you know, our other version of the good old days, which is back before anybody showed up, I mean, you find those moments on public land. Yeah. And yeah. once you learn how to, to mess with that system, and it can take a few years to really figure out, like, how to use public land properly, it is, I mean, that's the, that is the promised land. Right. And I, I feel like, man, I just like the experiences I've had out there, and part of what makes them so great is it, it, getting into it is a little bit harder. It takes a little bit more to learn. But I don't just hunt. I'm not just in it for like making the shots, right? right? I'm in it for the, the whole learning experience yeah. of it. And also, you know, the benefits you bring home with you. Yo, but I, it's just like, to me, it's not just that I went out and got a shot at an animal. Right. It's like, I want to go out and learn things, learn about the animal, learn the history of the area, learn some of the ecology of the area. And the class, the public land classroom is a much richer environment. Sure, sure. In my opinion. Definitely. Yeah. What's your favorite place to hunt? You got a question? Oh yeah, question from, uh, from one of our viewers. actually. Yep. Blue Line Bow Hunter. Said that hey Steve, I just shot a turkey this weekend. What cook should you recommend uh, for spring turkey? Like what recipes for yeah, spring? What, what would you recommend, for dude? Man, I, like more and more I do, more and more I do all my not all my turkey. I do a lot of my turkeys one way. I pluck them, which I, which I'm a firm believer in. Like don't skin it, but pluck. It doesn't take that long. It's not that big of a deal. Pluck the thing, then I split it down the backbone where I actually cut the backbone open, and then. And then lay, and basically you're cutting the turkey right in half. And I brine those halves and do them on a smoker. Okay. A very simple, like water, salt, sugar, brine. Like look up any brine for, for brine and poultry online. Do your turkeys that way and then put them in a pellet grill. Like Green Mountain Grill, Traeger Grill, Camp Chef makes when you know those pellet things. I love those things. You don't have to do it that way. It's a great way to do it. And it's just like, it's perfect turkey, man. There's, wow. there's no reason to think of wild turkeys as somehow inferior to domestic turkeys once you get them dialed in and know how to cook them right, uh, right. on top of that would you just uh, pheasants forever the uh, nonprofit organization asked any good recipes for pheasants same thing same thing because it's poultry dude i do so many white birds that way yeah i love them yeah that sounds like a heck of a recipe I no, could, it, it works so good we got uh, a question from eric kerr yeah he wants to try tongue should he go for beef or whitetail first 
Man, you know, I love to eat game tongues. Um, the problem you run into is once you get down, you know, like a bit, like a big mule deer can be quite a bit bigger than a whitetail, right? A big mule deer can have a tongue that winds up being worth the effort. Uh, whitetail tongues are pretty small, but but consider too, like in a lot of other countries, they're cooking lamb tongue, right? So it just if I was going to experiment with it, the nice thing about learning on beef tongue is it's just really big and you got a lot to deal with. But uh, to try to figure it out on, on a whitetail tongue, try it. The perfect world, though, you get an elk tongue, moose tongue, buffalo tongue, muskox tongue. Those are all big and great to mess with. But a whitetail tongue is, is borderline small. But the first tongue I ever tried cooking was a whitetail tongue. And, um, and that started me down the whole tongue path, man. And I'll tell you. You want to talk about something that doesn't get used and gets left in the wood a lot, woods a lot? It's tongues. No kidding. Do you, do you feel, you know, one thing I, I like about your show is, is you'll just jump in and, and eat anything at any point in time in your hunt. And do you feel that um, maybe some people have assigned you the, the guy who eats weird stuff? I mean, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I like, in some way, yeah, they do. Like, I, I, I definitely have, like, the reputation of, oh, the guy that eats crazy stuff. And I really don't, like, I don't try to do, like, I'm not trying to go and eat things for shock value, right? Right. I, I just think there's a lot of things that if you look at the global landscape, like what people are eating out there in the world, there's a lot of people who have um, developed systems for cooking, like, really great, you know, exemplary four-star restaurant quality food out of things that American hunters, due to lack of education, lack of cultural exposure, are just leaving in the woods. Sure. So it's like, I'm not like trying to like push the envelope and, and create bad meals. I'm trying to show people how to like create great meals with wild game using things that, that other, you know, other parts of the world, they might regard as the finest cut. Sure. You know, sure. Like, you take like shank. When I was growing up, we would take the whole shank on deer. So that's just like this part of a deer. We take the whole shank every time and grind it into burger. I did that for 20 years before realizing that there's this thing, asabuco, right? Which is like braised shank. And now when I look in my freezer, if I see nothing but roasts and steaks i'm a little bummed man because i want to look in there and see sure. all those shanks laying sure. there and it's just like a matter of sort of seeing what goes on in world cuisine and translating it down to what a guy in america can do yeah. who's out hunting yeah. big game small game whatever and and to that point i think it makes it so much more rewarding when you do look into your freezer and you do see the cuts that you don't traditionally hear about and knowing that you're going to utilize them is I just, it's neat. It's another neat thing that sportsmen and women can, can do to really get the full picture, to really get the full uh, experience. We've got another question here. We've got a question for Tony Bacon. What is your favorite in the field meal? Tony Bacon, favorite in the field meal? Yeah, Steve? my favorite in the field meal, I've had a few of them. Uh, one of the things that, like, that vi like visual qualities to, to meals, you know, matters. Oh, yeah. I remember one time, um, I'd heard about this from a sheep guide where he was talking about hunting doll sheep and what he would like to do once they killed a doll sheep. And, and anyone who's done that kind of hunting realizes it's very taxing. It's physically very taxing. You get very hungry. You get very tired of eating granola bars or energy bars and, and freeze-dried food. And after a few days of that or you know, a week or more of that, I mean, you're dying for like some kind of like fat-dripping meal. And, and a sheep guy was once explaining to me that he gets so hungry He'll take a rib rack off a of doll sheep, so basically like the whole rib part, you know, yeah. like this, right? And he'll build a three-sided rock shelter. So he's building like the walls of a little rock shelter, and as a lid, he like the the roof of the shelter is the rib rack. Wow. And then you start a fire inside there, and I mean that thing like the fat starts coming and dripping down and burning, and and you just make this sort of like charred mass of ribs, yeah. but you cook it long enough, you can start pulling it apart, and dude, like. It was, I'll always remember that meal. And I'll always remember a meal we made of taking black bear fat and rendering it down into oil and then frying black bear meat in the oil. But keep in mind when I'm talking about these meals that I thought were so good, keep in mind that we're talking about um, running on a major calorie deficit for many days and then eating very fatty foods. Yeah. So when I say my favorite, it's so like, it's very situational, sure. right? Cause like when I'm at home cooking for my wife and kids and when I'm home, we're just eating wild game every dinner, right? When I'm at home cooking for my wife and kids, I'm not like melting bear fat and frying bear meat and bear fat because it just isn't like how you really eat in that situation where sure. you've had breakfast, sure. you've had lunch, right? You're not looking for that. But those great meals I've found in hindsight often are sort of, they're sort of 
ending a period of, of suffering and privation. <laughs> and so they seem so great. Yeah. So it's hard to untangle like what actually sort of tastes good and what was the perfect thing at yeah. the perfect moment. Now mentioning them now and having been in those uh, similar positions, not necessarily hunting sheep, but, but something to that caliber after a few days of uh, cliff bars and yeah, and, uh, granola. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really good for sure. Yeah, because I'll point out too that I've also taken and just eaten um, bacon grease, you know, out of a cup with a spoon, sure. and thinking that was a wonderful meal. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got another question here. Yeah, your question from Vincent: uh, Which heart is the best to cook and eat, or has the most flavor? <laughs> question from Vincent here: Was it which heart or which part? Which heart? Which heart? Vincent asked: Which heart is the best to eat, and and uh, if you had to pick. Yeah, what heart, like what game heart is the best heart? You know, I, I don't, what I've found is um, there's a lot of variability, I think, in, in, in game animals, like from one to the next. But what's been most, almost more than the variability you find from one species to the other could be just the, vari the variables you find from different age classes of animals, sure. yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So you think like, oh, you know, antelope must be very different than mule deer. Well, there's also a lot of variability between one mule deer and, and the, the next, next mule yep, deer, yep. You know, which, is, which is as important or as great as you'd find between an antelope and a mule deer, right? Yep. So there's like tons of variability because you have factors of, of how old is the thing, right? What are, it, what are its conditions? What's it been feeding on? Is it in good shape or bad shape? Is it emaciated? Is it really fat? Like when you open up an animal and you find that he's got rump fat on him like that, you're like, this guy's been taking very good care yep. of himself. He might be like a great tasting animal. Sure. With all that said, I, I really don't know. I, I think that most guys, if you tried to Pepsi challenge them, like if you cut centimeters squares of, of game heart out of a white-tailed deer, a mule deer, an antelope, an elk, a moose, and cook them up, I don't think that most guys, even people who have like vast amounts of experience eating wild game, I don't think most guys are going to be able to pick out which heart was which heart. Um, I think there's like a thing about like what sizes are great, and there's something just very satisfying about an elk heart, right? It's yeah. just like, you, you hold that thing and it's just like, wow. It's like right. you're holding a chicken, right? you know? So I kind of like that, right. sort of like that shock value type thing. But, but I dig them all, man. Uh, my favorite thing to do with them, I like to slice them, marinate them, and just like a, like a vinegar oil kind of blend with some seasonings and then throw them on my grill and oh. grill them to medium. Yeah, yeah. And the key on eating heart, same thing, same thing with liver, is like, don't overcook that sure. stuff. You, sure. It doesn't need to be rare, but it's like it should be a little bit, you know, still a little purple in the middle. If you overcook it, it just sucks. We've got another question here from um, on Periscope. Rev the Truth wants to know what's the best way to get youth into hunting. Rev the Truth, Periscope, and for all listeners, this is an important one, no doubt. Yeah. Best way to get a youth into hunting. Man, um, you know, when someone asks me about the best way to get kids into hunting. I'm living it right now. Okay, I have a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old, boy, girl, boy. Um, I, I've often said when discussing hunting, I've often talked about how hunting tends to be this like patrilineal thing. Like if you just talk to people, like a lot of guys hunt. Like you know, 90% of hunters are guys. A lot of guys hunt because their dads hunted. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm definitely trying to break that, especially because my wife mandates that I do and like not treat our daughter any differently than the boys. And I do feel sort of this hereditary knee jerk thing where you're like, I don't know. It's just, I hate it in myself, but I feel this thing where I'm like, oh, the boy. Oh, no, 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 nope, not gonna do that. Yeah. The boy, you know, the boys and the girls. And, um, and it's something I really like, I, I battle that own like stereotype or that own prejudice and I'm overcoming it, but it's been slow. So I think that's like one important thing is with kids, man, like don't forget the daughters because we have a bad tradition. And, and, I, I'm not saying it's, it, it's awful, I think, but it's just a reality. And I don't want to act like it's not a reality. We have a bad tradition of being like very patrilineal about how we teach hunting and fishing to kids. Sure. So don't forget your daughters, first thing. And, and I'm focused very heavily on that. The second thing I think, little kids, they don't come out of the, uh, they don't come like into the world thinking about big old bucks or thinking about how a king salmon's cooler than a chum salmon, or thinking that a five pound bass is worth your time, but a five inch bluegill's not worth your time. That, those are all constructs that we create yeah. through a lot of exposure and doing things, right? We sort of build up these ideas like this is a pinnacle experience. This is like the thing you're actually after. This is a trophy great animal. That's learned. 
And I don't see any reason to impose that on kids who just want to be out. When I'm out fishing with my kids, I don't care if they catch a rock bass like this, okay, or a walleye like this. When they catch it, it's a celebration. We're going to bring that thing home. Mom's going to be so excited. We cook it. We make something great out of it. This is like Jimmy's fish. He caught this meal. We all eat the meal. It was so great. Best fish I ever had. I mean, it's like you're not manipulating, but you're just like creating a thing where you allow all your enthusiasm to shine through, and it's infectious, man. Yeah, definitely. They love it. Definitely. I don't have any concern. Like, people used to be like, well, what if your kids don't like to hunt and fish as much as you do? I'm like, well, I think two things about it. One, not many people like to hunt and fish as much as I do, so that wouldn't surprise me that much. But they're going to definitely have an appreciation for it. Sure. And so far, check me in 10 years, maybe I'll be wrong, so far I'm enjoying quite a bit of success. Good. In dealing with kids, and it's because I just really focus on, as, as serious as I take it, right, I try to focus on the fun, the celebration, and just, like, trying to avoid all, like, the really physically uncomfortable stuff that I think can turn kids yeah. off. I want them to suffer a little bit, not too much. Just so looking back at your own, at your own personal hist history, and this is something uh, hunters as a brother and sisterhood, I think we would all share. We could sit around a fire no matter where we were geographically in the world, and we could talk about our first hunts. You know, what was it for you? What was that, that hook, that, that defining moment, if you will, that first morning, that first evening um, that got you into this? That, can you recall the hunt, can you recall the place? You know, when I try to think back on, like, what was that, that early moment experience, early life experience that got me hooked on the outdoors, for me, it all happened so early yeah. that, that I really don't remember those moments. But, but you got to consider, so, so my, my father, you know, lifelong hunter and fisherman, um, and then I had older, older siblings who are two and four years older than me. So anyone who grew up with siblings knows that like, if, if the oldest one starts doing something, like if you have a brother who's four years older than you and he starts doing something at eight, that almost kind of means that you're doing it at four, you know? So because I had older siblings who were able to sort of run around and they knew how to, you know, string a rod and tie a thing on there and dig a worm out of the garden and go fishing. I was doing it like even younger than I otherwise would have been because I just followed my brothers along. So I sort of like got into all these things without, I mean, honestly, before I can really remember. Really? I remember, get, I remember getting my first deer, but I already had such a big foundation in that because, you know, growing up, my old man would put his tree stand, like he'd put his tree stand here, right? And he would then put a tree stand here, a tree stand here, and a tree stand here because anybody that wanted to was welcome to climb up and sit in the tree above sure. him. And so I just, growing up like that, I, I, I don't have it. What's been interesting is I've had the, you know, good fortune to take many, many people out on their first hunt. And when I watch that moment when someone goes on their first hunt and has sort of an experience, you know, killing an animal, butchering the animal, eating it, and I watch them have that experience, and it's like transformative and sometimes moves them to tears, but not in a bad way. Um, I look at that, and sometimes I'm a little jealous that I that I that I didn't get to have that as an adult to have that sort of like, oh my God, right moment you know right. because you sort of fall into this thing where you, you sort of get this feeling like you've seen most everything right you know i still see things now that surprise me but i've just have like accrued a lot of experiences at an early age where a lot of that sort of like initial shock and stuff is worn off sure you know? sure but i love to see it through new people and now i'm seeing it through my own kids yeah, right right a uh, couple of questions here go ahead yeah we got some coming in from instagram too uh s humphreys 10 wants to know what's must have seasonings or ingredients in your hunting pack S. Humphreys, 10 from Instagram, seasonings and ingredients in your hunting pack. Yeah, when I'm out in the woods, I'll carry, um, like, some basic cooking stuff, especially if I'm on, like, backpack trips or long trips. And, and, and my cooking kit varies a lot, right? So if it's, like, a lightweight backpack hunt, I might just have, a, you know, a backpack and stove like that. In that backpack and stove, I'll have a, a four-ounce bottle of oil, and I'll have some basic seasonings. On a river trip where you got boats involved or car camping trips, it might get you know vastly more elaborate. But just at that bare bones thing, like when I go into the woods, I'm usually carrying like a little bottle of oil, even if it's just like, like I said, two or three, four ounces of oil in a bottle. Because um, anything I do, like especially finding like wild mushrooms, any kind of cook, you can cook heart, you can cook liver. A little bit of oil goes a long way. And then with seasonings, man, I'm not, I don't have like a ton of brand allegiance, right? I just try different stuff. I'll sometimes just take simply salt and pepper, and mix it together. Or is there that stuff I can never pronounce the word? I use a lot like this, like like Tony Chak Chatri, you know. Yeah. Ch what is that yeah, stuff? I can't pronounce it. Yeah, C H A C H E R E or something. I'll grab that a lot because we used to eat a lot of that in college, yep. like a Creole seasoning. Sometimes I have Greek seasoning. Yep. Just something. A, a friend of mine has a company, Montana Max, right? He makes seasoning salts. 
I'll, I'll grab some of that. Just it really doesn't matter. Um, but I just carry it with me because, like I was talking about earlier, on those trips where you're, where you're going and going and going and not sort of eating what you're used to, when all of a sudden you get that big windfall of meat, I'd love to be able to eat it. Sure. And, and I can get a hell of a lot done with some oil, some salt, and some pepper. I could even strip that down to salt. Like if I had to bring one thing, I would bring a little baggie of salt, and I'd cook a lot of meals with that. Sure. Outstanding. We got another question coming in here. Another question from Mike Fitzgerald. Um, is there one animal you just couldn't get to taste palatable or something that you wouldn't eat again? Mike Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald asked a great question, one that I know I get asked as a sportsman a lot. Is there something that you've tried to cook you couldn't make palatable or you would just you would not pursue again because the taste was repulsive? Yeah, man. Um, I've experimented in my life. Like, like, if I have a thing that I would argue that maybe I've had, like, uh, that I know better than a lot of other people. It's like I've through my travels and all the people I've hunted and fished with, I've been able to experiment with a, like with an enormous variety of wild game, and that's done two things. One, it's taught me like a lot of tricks that you can do that kind of like make anything taste okay, and it's also given me chances where I run up against just brick walls on trying to get something to taste good. Um, thanks to sausage right you can really do a lot or even animals that some people might just just kind of write off like like javelina right javelina can have a pretty strong taste but javelina trezo if you go and eat the trezo that i've made with javelina i'm, I'm challenging you to tell that it's javelina you just wouldn't know because think about it it's like ground up cut with fat and then seasoned very heavily so if you get into sausage making, right, you can overcome a lot of problems if you get an animal you think like just doesn't taste that great. When I think about things that I've messed with that did, like, like they're just really hard to get there, um, I've messed around a couple of times. I know it's very popular in some areas of the country, like eating snakes. Anytime I've cooked like rattlesnakes, I've just felt like uh, like diminishing returns, sure, right? There's sure. just not that much there. And then there's a handful of fish species where you're dealing with so much bone, yeah. right? And, and the bone can be bad. Like, I like the bowfish, so I've experimented with co cooking various, what we call rough yep. fish, yep. carp, suckers, and stuff. The bone's a problem. But even then, you can make pickled fish, and the vinegar solution dissolves the bones. But you do start to get the feeling now and then, with all these things out there, right, that you can go after, um, some of them, it's almost like you're, you're, you're working so hard to try to make it just palatable, that I, my, my attention definitely steers away and goes towards those things that, that are a little easier, um, a little more forgiving, more likely to be, you know, smiled upon by my family. And so, yeah, sure. I, I've definitely like, gotten away. Like, I don't need to go mess with another carp. Right. right. And, and I've it, done it. I had some fun doing it. Now, when I look at a carp, I'm happy to let them. And go again, about to, his to, touch, to touch on what we talked about earlier, is you're not out there trying to be the guy that eats weird things no. necessarily. You know, so it's, <clears throat> it's, it's, there's no precedence necessarily in saying, well, you can eat that because uh, you could eat just about everything, I suppose. Yeah, and, and I know that if you put me into a situation where I had to eat just about anything, I would do as well or better than anybody else. Sure. But I, sure. I have developed right. some things that, like, like we're, just the other day, I took my kids fishing. We were targeting channel catfish, yeah. small channel cats, which are just phenomenal for fish sandwiches. And we were letting moon eye shiners go. Yep. Are moon eye shiners edible? You know, Lewis and Clark, I think it was Clark. He said that was his favorite fish in the Yellowstone River. I strongly disagree. <laughs> we did not retain any moon eye shiners. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's a good one. We've got questions pouring in here. Go ahead, Jimmy. Yeah, so on Instagram Live again, we've got Suey or Silly wants to know when you're packing out, bone in or bone out? Great question. Why that is a good question, out? man. Suey from Instagram Live, bone in, bone out. Yeah. I've got a story. I want you to share yours first. All right, packing meat, bone in, bone out. I, um... I like to go bone in. Now, now what, let me just clarify. What, what, the, what the question is referring to is like you, you kill a big animal in the back country or, or just where you can't get a vehicle to it, you got to move the thing, right? And so what everyone agrees on is that you're going to um, take the skin off, right, and you're going to sort of start removing edible portions of the meat. Now, traditionally when people talk about quartering something, what they're talking about is you, you're splitting the back. Like to literally quarter, you're splitting it right down the spine and then cutting each of those halves in halves, and that would be a quarter. In hunter lingo, to quarter something is basically you're cutting off all four legs, okay? So you're removing the, the shoulders, removing the back legs, the ball joints, and then you're carving away the other usable meat, like the neck, 
tenderloins, loins, ribs, and, and usually carrying that off. I like to just transport things on the bone because it's much easier to keep it clean. Um, you have a lot less loss from it drying out. Like if you have all these little pieces, every little piece is going to sort of form a rind around it as it dries or it's going to get dirt on it. And then later you got to trim all that off every little piece and pick hair off every little piece and you wind up with a, you wind up with a smaller and smaller and smaller pile of finished product. So even though it's more to carry when you carry it bone in, I like to carry it that way because I just have very good luck of keeping it clean, of not having a lot of loss from it drying out, and also that I'm able to go for long periods of time, sometimes surprisingly long periods of time, without refrigeration by keeping it, by keeping it in one big intact piece that has less surface area exposure. I keep that stuff at night when it's cool. I got it out to air out. I got it in the shade during the daytime when it's hot. And I have done some things that looking back on, I almost can't believe that we got away with it. I'm talking periods of seven, eight, nine days, not below freezing, but keeping quarters like great, healthy, beautiful meat. And I have, on the other hand, I've had really bad luck dealing with bags of little teeny scraps. Yep, yep. And if you guys remember on one of the last live events that we did, we cooked some, some suspect meat, if you will. It was a mule deer that I had taken on day one of an eight-day hunt. Um, and, and to Steve's point earlier here, bone in, um, circumstantial, of course, if it's a moose, they're very large. Sometimes you may have to take the bones out. But I hung that deer um, in a juniper tree for like seven full days. And it was warm um, during the day, but it was well shaded and had good airflow coming through it. It was very cool at night, so it lasted a long time. So. Yeah, you can get away with a lot once you get rid of the body heat. Yeah. Like when that stuff's spoiling, a lot of times what's spoiling is those animals run hotter than we do, right? So we're, we're 98, 6. I mean, a lot, a lot of these ungulates are running 104 degree body temperature. You got to get the body heat gone. The air temp isn't your enemy nearly as much as the animal's body sure. heat is. Sure, sure. We got some more questions coming in through here. We got a question from Desiree. Do you dry age? Desiree asks, do you dry age, my friend? I, I mean, I do, but not. I wish I knew to what like to what degree when when she's when, when Desiree says dry age. I wish I knew like to what degree she's speaking to. Sure. I do a form of dry aging where if all conditions are right, okay, where temperature, humidity, insect load, okay, when all conditions are right, I do like to hang up my quarters or hang up the thing and and dry age it. What I don't do is I've never gone so far as to go through any kind of elaborate steps to create a suitable dry aging environment. Sure. Um, I, you know, one time I remember my roommate, uh, he killed a cow elk, a, 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 like a yearling cow elk, and we like dry aged that thing in our garage only because the temperature every night would get down in the 20s and the day it wasn't getting warmer in the 40s. We ate the whole animal without ever freezing any of it. Wow. Perfect climate, like perfect condition, just like it kept going month after month after month, one like of those. January into February into March. And it was like great. It was this beautiful thing. I imagine it, it got better as oh, we by went. By the end, yeah, you, by the end of this period, you could like stick your finger through the meat, you know, wow. not rotten, but just perfect. So if I can, I do. Another thing I do that not a lot of hunters um, do what they should be aware of is that if you're, if you're looking ahead to your week, okay, and you have cuts of meat in your freezer, I will oftentimes take out roasts, and I like to freeze big blocks of meat. I don't cut them into steaks. I like freeze big muscle group pieces. If you on a Sunday, if you're thinking ahead to Friday or Saturday's dinner, and if you on a Sunday thaw out, you know, a few pound roast, thaw it out, dry it, I'll put that thing in a rack in my fridge, and then do, and I'll like age it during the course of the week, just one small piece. It might get a little dry on the outside, but you can go ahead and trim some of that dryness away, that like rind or crust that forms on there, and it's beautiful, man, and it really does, it really has a strong, the, the flavor's great. Um, the texture gets great. I love it. And I do the same thing with ducks, man. I'll put a duck, I'll gut a duck, wrap it up in a brown, in, in like a shopping bag, yep. a brown paper shopping bag, stick that thing in my, in my fridge for 10 days. Feathers on or, or feathers, feathers on. on? No kidding. Gut it out, washed right. out, 10 days, and it, the ducks like that are amazing. Incredible. Go ahead. Uh, we have a question from Periscope. Jimmy Miles wants to know, he is moving from the East Coast to the West Coast. Do we need to change up his hunting strategy or techniques at all? Jimmy Miles uh, from Periscope, moving from East to West Coast. Hunting strategy change up. 
Yeah, if you're, if you're moving from the East Coast to the West Coast and you're wondering if your hunting strategies are going to change, I, I don't, I think that that's unavoidable. I mean, it's just like, I don't know the exact details. You're going to be hunting new stuff in new ways. Even if you're already out there, like if you're on the West Coast and you're hunting black-tailed deer and, and, and you're hunting like, what, you know, Western turkeys, you're going to have, I would argue, kind of a rude awakening when you go to the East Coast because you're going to be dealing with, Perhaps, depending on a, a lot of variables on that sure up, you're going to be dealing with more competition, where your animals that are more heavily pressured. Now, if by West Coast you mean California, you're probably already dealing with like extremely pressured animals. But it's like, I don't see how it's avoidable. <coughs> it's going to be a lot different. I would just need a little more information to tell you exactly how it's going to be different. But I wouldn't expect that whatever tricks you develop there, I'm guessing, not that they ain't going to work there, but it's just going to be different. Man. Sure, It's sure. going to be different. Got a couple questions here too that we had uh, we had picked before we got onto uh, onto today's live event here. Um, you're a Western hunter. I like I like watching that especially. Uh, Brad Tucker asks any advice for finding and hunting elk and mule deer in heavily timbered areas like Oregon's Cascade Mountains. Man, I'm telling you, um, when it comes to like trying to find elk or mule deer in, in the in the Cascade ranges, it was like really dank, dark, thickly timbered, you know, mountains near the coastal ranges or in the coastal ranges no that that's a that's a hole in my personal experience i got friends that excel at it i know there are great books written about it but i think i'd be like being a little bit fraudulent if i was telling you like coastal range specific um strategies for that kind of stuff now i do hunt a lot of coastal country in alaska but up there it's a little bit different because of the latitude you get alpine zones at much lower elevations than you'd find elsewhere. So you, you, you could be down the lower 48, right? And you might have to go to 8,000 feet to get above tree line. As you go up in latitude, it's like going up in altitude. So the areas that I hunt in the coastal mountains of Alaska, the alpine zone is 2,000 feet. So you can, in a matter of a couple hours, hike into the alpine zone and find deer in the late summer that are very easy to find. One, because they still have a red coat. And two, because they're up above the trees and they're just you know, wandering around in places where you expect sure. to find a mountain goat. Um, but from my understanding of, of this, the same situation, which would be down, found in Washington, Oregon, vastly different, and I am not an expert. Here's another one here from Clint uh, Nardoni. Favorite headlamp and why? Man, when it comes to headlamps, like, dude, at work, we argue about this nonstop. <laughs> you know, like, guys like to argue about gear. And in fact, I shouldn't say guys like to argue about gear. People that hunt and fish, tend to like to argue about deer. I have tried at times unsuccessfully to withdraw from all gear arguments, to just be a passive presence during gear arguments. I can't do it, but I, I have a Surefire Minimus, okay? It makes you look like a hammerhead shark. <laughs> but I'm telling you what, it's like the simplicity of it. It's submersible. The battery, um, a problem with headlamps, they always turn on accidentally in your backpack. And the ones that are like tricky to get the batteries out, and there's like springs and all kinds of weird junk going on, you don't want to always be pulling the battery in and out. With a Surefire Minimus, I just unscrew the cap, turn the battery around, put the cap back on a little bit. There's nothing you could do. You could soak it like in the ocean. Nothing's going to happen to it. Sure. And it just it just takes a beating and keeps working, and I love that thing. Awesome. Sam Bartlett asks, do you sous vide? Man, I I'm getting into it. Like, yeah, someone asked about sous vide cooking, right? I'm getting into it. I have a new apparatus to mess with. I have so far, I've had some successes. I've had some notable failures. Um, I'm very excited about it because I'm a very avid brazer, right? So I like, I braise a lot of meats, basically like slow cooking meats in liquid, right? I do that all the time on the stovetop. I do it all the time in my oven. Sous vide is just a way to do it in a, in a much more controlled way. You can do it slower. Um, I'm getting into it, but I'm still in the I'm still in the like the the adopter phase so far. I think it's going to be great, but again, it's great for those cuts that have a lot of connective tissue, a lot of sinews, things like cooking shank or shoulder that are otherwise very tough, very stringy. Sous vide is a way to make them just silky and, and, and we'll, melt in your mouth. We'll come back to you on that one too. We're starting to do a little bit of sous vide here. I know Ruben, one of our guys, is getting big into it too. So we'll we'll come back on that one. We're pretty interested. We've got another question here. Go ahead, Danielle. We got a question from Jonathan. Um, why do you prefer bits of butcher paper over vacuum sealing? 
Jonathan asks a really cool question. Why butcher paper over vacuum sealing? I use, uh, when, when I'm wrapping game meat, I use butcher paper and I use vacuum. Um, and I kind of have some things that just work for me. Now, of course, a lot of, the, a lot of stuff that has to do with hunting and also processing game comes down to personal experience. And it's kind of like getting your system dialed in, right? What's right for one guy isn't right for the next guy. I tend to do fish, poultry, other things I tend to do in vacuum sealed bags. Um, but I have had great luck when dealing with lean red meat. Okay, so like lean red meat is pretty shelf stable. Like when you put it in the freezer, there's not a lot that goes wrong. What's usually breaking down in the freezer and, and turning bad or giving you off flavors is like fat. Okay, like fat decomposes in your freezer over time. You might not think it does, but it does. That's why you can freeze a piece of very fatty salmon and it's going to get off tasting in a matter of a couple months, whereas you could freeze a walleye filet, which is very lean, and that thing somehow is going to still taste great seven, eight, nine, ten months down the road. It has to do with like the fat breakdown. Lean red meat, I do, I wrap plastic wrap on it, and I get all the bubbles out, and I get like a nice tight wrap, plastic wrap, and then I go freezer paper over that. And one of the things I like is I don't need to worry about it puncturing. So when I do all my fish, okay, like halibut, salmon, everything I do in vacuum bags, you need to handle them very gently because everyone knows the feeling of putting a vacuum sealed bag in your freezer, then you open your freezer a week later and the vacuum sealed bags aren't sealed anymore and there's just like a lot of air in there and it's full of ice crystals and stuff. That's from puncturing or from failed seals. I don't need to worry about puncturing or failed seals when I'm using freezer paper. And the reason I get away with it anyways is that stuff likes to be in your freezer. It, People, this surprises people all the time, but like, I could pull meat out of my freezer that's been in there. The way I wrap it, I could pull a game loin, a deer loin out of my freezer, and I'm not joking. That thing could be two years old, and you would not know it. My wife will see that label and be like, what? And I'm saying, just, tr just forget. Forget you saw that. Trust me. Eat it. It's fine. It's like I get away with murder on red meat that's wrapped in plastic wrap and freezer paper. But prep on the front end. That is the, that is the key to success. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sure, yeah. It go, but yeah, because it, it's going in as perfect as I can get it, yes. right? It's not, like, it's not like I'm like putting just, you know, ran, like half thought, randomly sorted things in there. I'm putting things that are in there with, with an eye toward, with my mind toward long-term preservation. It's been trimmed to fat. That's, it's clean. It's ready to ticket. go. That's a ticket. Uh, Danielle, you've got another question here. Okay, we got one last question. <laughs> Hank asks a very important question for this time of year especially. You picked 30 morels today. Good on you, my friend. Tell me where your spot is. Just email it to me. It's fine. Uh, how do you cook them up? Yeah, man. Right now, everybody's talking about morels. I've had probably four conversations about morels today. I'll be having more morel conversations tomorrow when I'm out picking some. Um, I, like, you know, I used to dry a lot of morels. I've gotten away from that because I think, like, I just love fresh morels so much. When I get them, I pull in what, what I can use personally, and it's just one of those things I share with friends and share with people sure. around me. Um, so I used to get, a, I've gotten away from drying them. But that's the thing you can do. If you go and, you know, pick tons of them, you don't have any friends, or you, don't, or you want to be, you know, greedy, or not, that's a strong word, you want to hang on to yourself, you can cut them in half, put them out, and dry them for later. I like to eat them fresh. When I eat them fresh, I like to just saute them very gently in butter, with some minced up garlic, and then I put a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper on them, and it's just, it's a magical yeah. thing. And I'm not in a situation where I'm eating them like, you know, three times a day over the course of a month because I'm giving so many of them away. But the handful of meals that I do for myself every year, the simpler, the better. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, folks, we're going to be wrapping it up here, but I want you um, to know that we could spend literally all day with Steve Rinella, uh going over everything from game prep to adventure to, uh, to conservation and everything else. So there's a lot of questions that may not have gotten answered and we didn't want to ignore you or are just unfortunately limited on time. Please email them in. Um, shoot them uh, over to us on the Facebook. Shoot them over to us on Instagram, on Periscope, whatever. We want to get to those questions. We'll answer them the best we can. Steve's team is going to work on that as well. Um, so messenger pigeon, smoke signal, uh, email, hard copy, whatever you got, shoot it in. We'll try to get to you as quick as we can. Um, also, we did a podcast today. We want you guys, if you want to, if you want to listen to it, check it out on iTunes uh, or check it out at TheMeatEater.com, Steve's website. And um, as always, thank you so much for tuning in. It is our great honor to be able to do this with you guys. Uh, thanks for keeping the wheels turning and the fires burning. If any questions, anytime, please don't hesitate to, to look us up.
Thanks, guys. We'll catch you next time. Good talk, man. Yeah, good talk. Thanks.